Fantastic. Thank you very much. That's great. I've heard, um, I've been also been in the Lord for about 40 years. And that's the first testimony I heard was somebody received in an old chook shed. That's really good. There you go. Um, I, um, I'm going to talk about the original manuscripts of the Bible. And, um, and here's the first thing. There are no original manuscripts left. The very original ones that, you know, they took a, 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 whatever they took. Wasn't a, wasn't a big pen, but something, and they wrote, they have all perished to our knowledge. Everything that's around today is a copy of some sort, including the Bible that's on your lap. But there's some very interesting things to say. There's some very old manuscripts around, and they date back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. In fact, back to around the um, third, second and third centuries. Now, if you were to go to London, if you're fortunate enough to go on holidays, you went into the British Museum. As you go in through the front foyer, there's a room to the left. And this room has all sorts of literary wonders. And it's not just old writings, it's things of interest. Uh, for instance, um, when um, Ringo Starr first got, got the idea for the, the song, It's a Hard Day's Night, he scribbled it on the back of a packet of cornflakes, that packet of cornflakes is there. Uh, when um, Agatha Christie first uh, perhaps had some ideas about death on the Nile and she scribbled out some notes on a bit of paper, that paper is there. And you can go around and you can look at all these amazing things that are parts of contemporary history and older things. And then you'll come across the Sinaitic Bible. It's not the complete Sinaitic Bible, it, uh, it's the main part of it. There are other portions, leaves of it around the world, but it's the, it's the major part of the Sinaitic Bible. It's a remarkable Bible. In fact, it, it ended up in the hands of the Russians in their library. They sold it to the British Library for £100,000, now being valued at £4.7 million because they have to insure these things. So that was a bad, that was a mistake selling that. Anyway, um, it's in the British Library and there it is. And it is remarkable for a very interesting reason. And that reason is Mark 16, as we know it, which we, we talk about Mark 16 when we witness. People say to us, well, who says that you have to speak in tongues? Well, here in Mark 16, it says, these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall speak in new tongues. And then to confirm that, it, it says that they went out to the world and preached the gospel and were able to confirm it with signs following. So it's very, very integral uh, to what we believe and so on. And sometimes people have said to us, may have said to you, well, actually, that part of that, that section isn't actually in the Bible. That's been added in. Mark chapter 16, the end of the book of Mark, finishes at verse 8. Well, verse 8. I just looked it up on my phone. Sorry, I haven't got a. And, well, let's go to verse 7, uh, Mark 16, verse 7. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There you shall see him. And he said unto you, and they went out quickly and fled from the sepulchre, for they were trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. And that's the suggestion is that's not only the end of that chapter, that that's the end of the book of Mark. Now, every other book that we look at in the Bible ends up with something positive, something definite, something uplifting. The word amen is quite common. But here, the suggestion is that beyond verse 9, it's been added in later, um, and that uh, it finishes with, and they were afraid. So... From verse 9 to 20, or verse 10 to 20, actually, that's an error. Um, uh, in, some, in some versions, we've, it's been said to us that it doesn't actually belong in the Bible. And sometimes we don't know what to say. Or we, we haven't heard that. So this talks all about that. And it doesn't matter at the end of the day 
that you forget all of this talk. But what matters is that when somebody says that to you, 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 you know you have an answer for it. Okay, so let's, here we go next, the scripture. Okay, I'll read it. And now, um, so after verse 8, now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared at first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils, and she went and told them that he had been with them, and they mourned and wept. And then when they had heard that he was alive and he had been seen of her, believe not. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went out and they went and told it unto the residue, neither believe they them. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as he sat at meat and upbraided them with, with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name thou shalt cast out devils, they shall speak of new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, sat on the right hand of God, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Okay, so we won't go into all those issues concerning people who, as it said, casting out of devils. Obviously, it talks about people with mental disorders and there's talk about protection there. But there's a, a really strong um, drift here about signs that will follow them that believe and being able to go out and confirm the gospel with these signs. It's very powerful and it's, it's, it's also reiterated elsewhere in the Bible. So, is that going to the next one? Yeah. So pr proving the authenticity of these verses, there's the evidence in the Greek manuscripts, the evidence of the ancient versions, evidence from the writings of early church leaders, other evidence from the pages of the Bible, and the evidence of your experience. So the day that you get filled with the Holy Spirit, it's no longer a foreign book. You are part of it, and it's a part of you. And you kind of look at it and you, the same spirit that was there when Noah boarded the ark is now in you and you kind of know. So there's that. Okay. So first of all, going back to ancient manuscripts, as I said, there's no original ones. Uh, they are all copies. Um, a manuscript is a copy of the New Testament in the Greek language. There's two types. Unseal, the more ancient manuscripts written in ancient style of Greek in which capital letters only were used. And cursive, appear from about the ninth century onwards, a cursive style flowing hand. So it's straight away when you pick up a manuscript, if you're allowed to touch it, probably shouldn't, um, you can tell if it's from before or after the ninth century. Okay, now... So this is a bit of a, a sort of a hand-drawn map that gets, keeps me out of copyright problems. So there's, there's two manuscripts that don't have this section of Mark 16 in it, from 9 to verse 20, okay, that um, finish with the words, and they were afraid, okay? The first one's the, the Vatican and then the Sinaitic. I mentioned the Sinaitic. It completely omits it. But here's the interesting thing. The Vatican one, they're both contemporary in terms of time. Um, you know, fourth, early 4th fourth century, the Vatican one leaves a space. It leaves a space, and that space of white paper or parchment is exactly big enough for it to be put in. Okay? Now, nowhere else in that manuscript is there a space between any, any chapter or any book. And as though, as though the um, person reading it or writing it uh, was unsure as though the writer of the manuscript hesitating whether to omit or insert it thought it safest to leave a space for them. Okay, which is really interesting. So, and I've color-coded this, and it'll make sense as we go on. Uh, the Sinaitic completely omits it. So there's something interesting about this period as well. Let's go to the next one. Oh, there's an earlier manuscript. Oh, this is good, because obviously when you're looking for evidence, you want the earliest, the oldest. And it's called the Chester Beatty Manuscript. 
And uh, the Chester Beatty manuscript is in the Chester Beatty Library in England, with the exception of some isolated fragments of the New Testament. It's very old. This is the most ancient New Testament manuscript in Greek, of course, today. This manuscript is generally believed to date back to the early third century, between 200 and 250 AD. Unfortunately, many sections of it are missing, having been lost or having perished owing to its great age. One section that is missing is the whole of Mark 12, 12 to Luke 6. So uh, it doesn't tell us. Consequently, it provides no direct evidence one way or the other with regard to Mark 16, 9 to 20. However, with regards to the nature of the text in the Vatican manuscript, the following conclusion was made with the Chester Beatty manuscript provides as important. In 1933, the British Museum published its findings on the Chester Beatty manuscript. And it said, it has stronger affinities of other manuscripts uh, than the Vatican, the Vatican manuscript. Its closest affinities are with a group of authorities which have only recently been recognized as such and which have received the title of Caesarean from the proved use of authorities of this type by Oregon in his later years in Caesarea. It points perhaps decisively to the conclusion that the Vatican manuscript does not represent a text of original purity dominant in Egypt, Egypt throughout the second and third centuries. Now, this is interesting because they found there's certain corruptions in the Greek language in these two, two, um, two manuscripts, the Vatican, the Sinaitic. Now, we all know uh, from our experience that language becomes corrupted over the years. And uh, even with the English that we speak, there are so many expressions that we use that aren't really uh, proper English. Um, in fact, Liz and I once met a fellow who was studying English overseas and his English was beautiful, but he had trouble understanding me. He had no trouble understanding Liz for some strange reason. And it got, it got us thinking about all the things that we say and how they're not proper English. It's also interesting that there's things that we say that date uh, what, we, what we're saying. For instance, um, you, you might say um, um, this, um, oh, going there was as good as eating apple crumble, okay, you could say. But it's become more common in the last 15 years or so that for somebody to say, oh, going there is as good as without even having the superlative. Now, they didn't do that in the 1970s, but it has appeared in the last 15 years or so. It's as good as. So right throughout history, and it's the same when we watch movies, the language tends to date it. When we see the way people talk in different decades, we get an idea of the period and also the country it's from. There's, there's, there's uh, expressions that are used in other countries that aren't used here and so on. So language is corrupted over a period of time. Now, this in itself doesn't particularly mean anything, but it does when you start referring it to other versions of the manuscript. And because they, they found a number of corruptions that wasn't contemporary, we find out with later manuscripts uh, that we're going to talk about in a moment that they obviously copied, not from these, but earlier ones. Does that make sense? Kind of. Okay. So let's go to the next one. And there's the next one. And there, okay, so now I've color-coded and I've done it in red and blue because blue, we say red is a, is a manuscript that's on fire. It's got the full reading of Mark 16. But a blue one is where they've chucked a bucket of water on it and tried to put that fire out. So the Chester Beatty is in both colors because we don't know. So we've just got these two. And, you know, when somebody says to you, the oldest known manuscript doesn't have Mark 16 in it. That actually, that actually, it's a true statement. But they don't know that because they've studied it and learned it. They know that because somebody else has said it to them and they're repeating it. So this is just to give you the background information. So, so there's other ones. I'll have a quick look over here. The Alexandrian has been in the custody of Great Britain since 1628. This manuscript contains a full reading of Mark 16. Okay. In fact, all of these do, but it might be worth mentioning that some of them contain extra bits, what they call an apocryphal um, addition, where somebody's thrown another bit in, which can be disregarded. The, um, 
Reference is made to an 8th century manuscript. This is the Regis. Oh, yeah, that's there. Um, manuscript. Another 8th century and 9th century manuscript, the Lorenzus manuscript, has since been discovered, which also contains an apocryphal edition. Um, but it has a full, nevertheless, it contains a full passage of Mark 16. Also, the Washington manuscript has since been examined, being acquired in Egypt in 1906. This manuscript of about the 5th century also contains a full reading of Mark 16, 9 to 20. Um, but it has a remarkable insertion, which can otherwise be rejected. It's no other, no other copies. So, excuse me, so every other manuscript, including after the 9th century, 2,500 cursive manuscripts, copies of originals have been made and uh, in every case, they continue contain a full reading of Mark 16 as we know it. So this really begs the question of why did they omit it? Why was it cut out? What was happening in that particular time? Well, I've got a really old revival centre leaflet, which you've probably all got in your cupboard somewhere. And uh, we don't have many of these leaflets anymore. And in fact, the fact that it's falling apart, Testament, it's not, it's not as old as those though. Speaking in tongues is the Bible evidence of Holy Ghost baptism. So there's a really interesting quote in here. It's a bit wordy, but the Reverend John Wesley said, it does not appear that these extraordinary gifts of the Holy Ghost were common in the in, in church for more than two or three centuries. That's interesting, isn't it? You see what happens after three centuries? We seldom hear of them after that fatal period when the Emperor Constantine called himself a Christian and from a vain imagination of promoting the Christian cause, thereby heaped riches and power and honour upon the Christians in general, but on particular on Christian clergy. From this time, they almost totally ceased. Very few instances of the kind being found. The cause of this was not, as has been vulgarly supposed, because there is no more occasion for them because all of the world had become Christian. This is a miserable mistake. Not a 20th part of it was then even nominally Christian. The real cause was that the love of many, almost all Christians so-called, was waxed cold. The Christians had no more of the spirit of Christ than the other heathen. The son of man, uh, when he came to examine his church, could hardly find faith. This is why the real cause, this is, was the real cause why the extraordinary gifts of the Holy Ghost were no longer to be found in the Christian church, because the Christians were turned heathen again and had only a dead form left. The grand reason why the miraculous gifts were so soon withdrawn was not only that faith and holiness were well nigh lost, but that dry, formal, orthodox men began even then to ridicule whatever gifts they had not themselves and to decry them either all as either madness or impostures. Isn't that remarkable? Now, another reference, I hope I can remember this one. It's out, it's out of Fox's Book of Martyrs, not recommended reading, unless you like a very heavy read. And I don't know how much of it's true. But it does say that at this particular time, that what permeated the church was selfishness, pride, and self-opinionation. The opposites of those are selflessness, humility, and divine revelation. So they had problems. And nobody can say it better than Wesley said it here. They pushed it out. They cut it out. And so these verses, which said, these signs shall follow them that believe, and they shall go out into the world and preach it and conf confirm it with signs following, that must have been difficult for them. And they decided to cut it out. And in one case, they were unsure. Well, are we going to go this way or not? We'll leave a space. The other one, they cut it out. They cut Jesus out. They cut Jesus out and they cut it out of the Bible. So anyway, that's how we see it. So let's go on a little bit further. Now, I mentioned the curse of manuscripts uh, written later in the ninth century. Uh, from the point of antiquity, many of these manuscripts do not have provided us with a very ancient testimony, being themselves of a relatively modern date and in many cases being copied from manuscripts of uncertain antiquity. It is thought that a few of them, however, 
uh, may have been copied from Greek manuscripts more ancient than any we possess today. Once again, the, the purity of the language is a guide. The uh, uh, unanimous testimony in favour of Mark 16 does therefore provide us with important evidence. At the present time, over two and a half thousand cursive manuscripts exist. They represent the Greek Testament as it was accepted and received for over a thousand years. Okay. Now, the next one. The evidence of the ancient versions. An ancient version are the earliest translation of the New Testament into other languages of those nations to which the gospel was first taken. So your Bible on your lap is, an, is a version of a manuscript, okay? It's probably fairly recent, 20, 30, 40 years old maybe. And, um, but, of course, they were copying it in other languages right back from the beginning. Okay, so I've got another little guide here through the ages, and I'll go through a couple of these quite quickly. We want to get down to the, the most important thing. The Philoxonian Syriac version was a revision uh, of the earlier Peshitta Syriac version. You can see them where, where they, where, when, they were, when they were written. They weren't found then, but they when they were written. This was done that the Syriac version would agree more nearly with the original Greek. This version contained a full reading of Mark 16. The Peshitta Syriac is thought to date about 411 to 435. Some have believed this translation may date back even to the third or even the second century. This version was the great standard version of the ancient Syriac church. It also contained a full reading of Mark 16, 90 to 20. And here's this one in blue. Once again, we've got the colour thing happening. The Sinaitic Syriac. Only one copy of this version is known to exist. This one doesn't have Mark 16 in it. It was discovered in 1892 at the same monastery on Mount Sinai, where about 50 years before the Sinaitic manuscript had been discovered, which is St. Catherine's Monastery. They, they opened up a room that had been blocked off. I was reading about it yesterday. Anyway, they find this um, other manuscript 50 years later, but it's contemporary. Its age is contemporary. Um, varying estimates have been made concerning its age, but it is probably contemporary with a Sinaitic and Vanium Vatican manuscripts. Its text is very similar to that of the Vatican and Sinaitic manuscripts, which text has already been shown to be of not original purity. The Sinaitic Syriac contains several corruptions in its text and would appear to present a text of even more corruptions than the Vatican manuscripts, certainly not a text for reliable evidence. The similarities between this version of the Vatican and Sinaitic manuscripts and possibly the fact that its place of discovery was the same as that of the Sinaitic manuscripts seemed to point of one common ob origin and but one source for the original omission of the passage under consideration. Now, the Curitanian Syriac, Syriac, this version of the New Testament gospel, first arrived at the British Museum in 1842 from the library of the monastery in the Nitrian Desert in Egypt. The date of the origin of this text is of this version is believed to go back to about 200 AD which is, of course, earlier than either the Sinaitic or, manus or Vatican manuscripts, and it goes on. In the Curitanian Syriac, also very ancient, far earlier than the Sinaitic copy of that version, the Gospel of Mark is wanting. Oh, no, it's wanting, with the exception of one fragment only, and that fragment contains the last four, version, four of these disputed verses. So it's got a bit missing. But then it's got, it cuts out signs following, sorry, it cuts out baptism, but it's got everything about signs following and the Great Commission. So it's in there. And then finally, finally, uh, or the, not, not finally, the Coptic versions, they all have uh, Mark 16, the Latin versions, the Syriac and the Coptic versions give us the plain testimony of the Eastern Church. The Latin versions give us a testimony of the Western Church. These versions provide us with very positive evidence. The old Latin version takes us back to within a generation or two of the time when the New Testament books were written, perhaps about 150 AD. The old Latin version is consequently one of the most valuable and interesting evidences which we possess for the condition of the New Testament text at its earliest times. The unanimous evidence of the old Latin versions is in favour of the full reading of Mark 16, all copies without exception containing it. 
Oh, hang on. There we go. So I've put those parts together. That's the manuscripts on the left, the, um, the ancient versions on the right, and I've done a connection between the Sinaitic Syriac because we, we know that they're connected because of text and location. And then we've got these two, the Old Latin and the Curitanian Syriac, and, of course, they have been copied. And they can't be copied from the Vatican manuscripts because they didn't exist yet. They can't be copied from the Sinaitic manuscripts because they didn't exist yet. They had to be copied from other manuscripts which have perished that had the full reading of Mark 16. So once again, if somebody says to you, well, you look at the oldest manuscripts, Mark 16 isn't in there. Well, it's actually a true statement. But it doesn't show the truth because the truth is the oldest evidence shows it definitely belongs there. And these two or three represent a time where the church was in trouble and they were trying to cut out the stuff that mattered because they'd lost their sight. And of course, we know from history that there was a, what we might even call the dark ages of Christianity. And of course, we've got this great pouring out of the Holy Spirit that existed in um, England and so on right through the late 18th century, those great Welsh revivals and so on, and they spilled out across the world. And of course, you, you, we need to understand that prior to the eight, mid 18th century, people weren't free to believe and preach or, or, or worship as they liked. Often it was a case of what the, the king said or what the government said. That's what people had to believe. And if they didn't, it was great, great trouble for them. But, of course, this freedom started to exist in mid to late 18th century where people were given freedom and people started to seek for it and people started to receive it. And so we've had this great pouring out of the Holy Spirit. And now as we go through this period, and we have this great luxury now, particularly here in this country, and we look back, and we look back at some of these things that are said, because now, because we have this great pouring out of the Holy Spirit, we also have, we also have a great um, problem with Pentecost, as we know, has developed, where there's all sorts of variations. And um, so now that we get these things said to us, we can look back and we can get a very clear idea of the ancient evidence. The evidence is overwhelmingly that what we preach is right. It belongs in there. It also says it elsewhere in the Bible. It's, it's part of our experience. So that's pretty much it, but hang on one more. Okay, the manuscripts used in the unbelief argument are not of original purity in regard to their text, stem from a time when the church was sliding into ritualism, pride, selfishness, and human reason, do not represent the oldest evidence in regards to Mark 16. <laughs> The ancient versions pre uh, present evidence 100 to 150 years earlier than the Vatican or the Sinaitic manuscripts. So, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the, our, the word of our God shall stand forever. Okay, so just finally to reiterate, you don't need to remember any of this. But if anybody ever says anything to you when you think, oh, crumbs, I don't know, I, you do know, it's okay. And just because they're repeating something has been said to them doesn't mean they know what they're talking about. Anyway, that's it. Thanks, Pastor.